so a robust archive, I mean, that's, this is a question that um, it's a, um, amusing and ironic that you put the question to me because I think this is the question uh, at some level, explicitly or otherwise, that um, you and Katie and Michael are dealing with, with, with the assistant of, assistance of um, undergraduate interns like Danielle. Um, uh, so I don't think, um, I don't think robust has um, a given definition is the way I would put it. It could be robust, I don't know why I said Danielle, I meant Nicole. Um, uh, I mean, robust could be a collection that was very narrow in scope. Let's say uh, it only it was totally focused on the single back card, so it went from 1873 to 1907. So it's not given the history of postcards, and that's in the U.S. The dates are somewhat different um, around the world. Um, but only within a matter of, well, the beginning of postcards actually has a, a longer history in Europe, um, but, but um, in Europe the countries basically went to the um, splitting the address, um, uh, the double back card, within a, a, um, a short period of a couple of years, so there's less differenti differentiation there. Um, but you could do something that was smaller in scope, but that had a lot of depth to it obviously. Or you could do something that's much larger in scope, but then it's, and you might have as much depth to it, but it would take you longer to get there. So that's one way to think about it in terms of time. Another way to think about it is in terms of type. Um, as you all know, I think, better than I, there are many, many different types of postcards, and those are types that are given types, I would say, rather than what people did with them. So, for instance, um, you, we could have a type called birthday postcards, and version A would be a birthday postcard that is printed by the publisher, and version B would be a postcard that actually looks like it's a tourist postcard, let's say, but it is turned into a birthday postcard. So that would be another way of imagining um, a robust um, archive. Another, and I've hinted at this now, obviously, but do does one want an archive of unmarked postcards, or does one want an archive of written postcards? Does one want an archive of stamped postcards? Um, so the, the categories proliferate. Um, I guess what I think robust means in this context, then, is that you have sufficient N that you can make some generalizations about what you see. That is to say, you have, and, and actually in thinking a lot about this relative to this um, sabbatical project um, that I'm engaged in uh, called uh, uh, The Way We Were, a uh, um, uh, cultural history of vernacular writing in the 20th century America. And I'm, I'm not sure that'll be the, the working, that's not much of a working title, it's a mouthful. But, but one of the things I've struggled with is basically the same issue. Because there's no archive of everyday writing. There's a national archive, there are archives in state governments, there are archives in museums, there are archives in libraries, there are archives in universities, there are archives in nonprofits. There are lots of different archives. But there's no archive of everyday writing. So what constitutes an archive is one question. Um, and then one way to think about the robust issue, the adjective there, is to think, I think, in terms of a corpus. What Now that's actually you know, corpus coming from linguistics, but what constitutes a corpus? At some level, it's the same question about N, right? How What's critical mass is another way to put it. Um, and um, the number of postcards that were mailed um, in the in the early 1900s it was millions and millions. So you're not going to track all those down. Um, I think you have to have again enough to allow you to make some generalizations, or some. To, and if you have that enoughness, if you will, um, 
satisfies is the term that people used to use 25 years ago, which was a sort of combination of satisfying and, you know, uh, sufficing. Um, then, then you can begin to talk even when, when a category doesn't have a lot of critical mass. So, for instance, um, this postcard, um, which I did pick up in Australia, was published in Hong Kong, uh, does attend to document um, a storm damage in 1926, so I think we can presume that this is uh, moving on to almost 100 years old. That's pretty interesting. Um, in all the postcards I've seen, I've not seen one that has this kind of a back. That's, that's interesting. It's not, um, how many more of these do I have to collect in order to say that it's interesting? I, I don't think so many more. And the other part of this maybe is that if you have enough of a robust archive, then when you come across something that's anomalous, which is basically what I'm pointing to here, it raises the question about whether it is anomalous. Maybe, in fact, postcards that were published in Hong Kong at this moment in time do look like this. And so that would suggest, if that's the case, that there's a whole other category that we include in the archive, even if it's a category that's not well populated, as it were, it still is a category that helps us begin to understand something about the genre itself. So there's an interesting tension here, two tensions, one between the archive as it's constructed and what you find and how that talks back to the archive so that the archive um, is a living archive and is and continues to grow and develop as the research continues. But the other has to do with um, postcards in different cultural contexts and how they undoubtedly are going to look very different even at the same time that they look um, something of the same. This one, for instance, does have a set of lines for um, uh, presumably an address and a box, which is presumably for the stamp, even while it takes um, uh, a vertical orientation. So that's pretty interesting. In other words, the same time you're plotting difference, you're doing that in the context of what is also similarity.